Next up, we have Liz Parrish, CEO of BioViva, and as this panel is on outreach, um, you know, one of the, the leading figures in, in outreach in this industry for a good number of years. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here again this year. <laughs> so I am a CEO of BioViva. I am a COO of a company called Genorisis, and I am the president of Best Choice Medicine. But what I identify with is being a patient. In 2015, I partook in two experimental gene therapies to see if we could reverse my biological aging. I have a disease of aging, and I wanted to treat it to see if we could help 8 billion people live longer. I did not know how much this would challenge the entire industry, the entire system. I didn't know that it could be actually illegal to treat my own body with gene therapies. That's pretty sad. We underestimate the patient. The one good thing that I had going for me is that I was actually relatively healthy. I would say that I had biological aging as a disease, but I didn't hurt. I wasn't terminal at the moment, and I wasn't in pain. Most patients who need medicine today are all three of those things. And in today's society, we tend to write them off, that there is no treatment to treat them. And if there was, it's experimental, and we shouldn't try, and that leads to the worst-case outcome. That will lead to the death of 41 million people this year. And to be on that side of history is the wrong side of history. We must be pushing for the use and the advocacy of new and innovative medicines. Last year, I introduced the concept of best choice medicine. And I went home from this conference and started to write a law. And I wrote a law with some help of some very important friends that could be instituted in any government in the world, any state or province that would be a pre-regulatory route that would give people access to medicine now, innovative medicine that otherwise they cannot obtain through acts like right to try or compassionate use. I think that it's important that we start to change the world one step at a time, one patient at a time today. There's a lot of reasons to do it economically, and I don't like to hang a heavy hat on economics. The price of one life is invaluable. But we do have a coming crisis. With the growing um, aging population, less people in the workforce, things like Social Security, uh, certain pensions, and certain other government um, uh, institute uh, it, programs like Social Security and every other country of the world are becoming stretched. And by 2023, it's suggested now that these will have to start to cut payments towards treatments. Medicare is running out. If we only cut these expenditures by 10%, it will lead to the death of millions of people. We need to mitigate aging. We need to help people live longer and healthier, stay in the workforce, and be productive. We can also drive innovation with pre-regulatory routes. We'll have places for our children who are coming out of education, universities, colleges, all over the world, going into high-tech industries right in our backyards. They won't have to leave the country for more innovative places. We will have jobs, we will have resources, and we will own the technology of the future. If you look at emerging countries now, they're actually starting to buy into gene and cell manufacturing to make sure that they don't get shut out. And it's a pretty smart idea. Driving down the cost of medicine has a lot to do with lowering these regulatory prices. So the high price of going through the regulatory system does not make a safe drug. We have to get that out of our head. 
the opioid crisis alone killed so many people that it skewed the lifespan data in the United States. We have regulated and passed through regulation some of the most dangerous drugs in the world that were pulled off the market within just a couple of years of being passed through a gold standard. We have to get our minds off of the relying on the regulatory system for these safe drugs. And let me put that into perspective. Over the last five years, I have worked with medical tourism. This is where people travel to get access to new and innovative medicine. We have never seen one major adverse drug event. But in the gene therapy space, in the regulatory system, we've seen six deaths in the last three years. These were avoidable. These were known toxic levels of AAV gene therapy. It was in the literature. When you allow people to be intelligent, to take responsibility, they actually do intelligent things when they don't lean back on a system. Today's drugs are old. The drugs that you're prescribed are at least 15 years old, if not older. We're having a hard time getting innovative drugs into the regulatory system. My company, BioViva, applied for our pre first pre-IND this year, and we have another one we're going to apply for later in the year. We're very hopeful, but we don't know if they'll get our point. This is catastrophic to patients. Our animal data, I, I agree with uh, Brian Kennedy, using aging models of, of mice, natural wild-type mice is a great model, using fake or you know, contrived disease models that mice don't naturally have probably is not as great, but it is valuable. But the problem is, is it's not translating to the drugs that we need in the cases and how fast we need to move. So we do need to do some animal testing, but we cannot rely on it, and we cannot keep doing it. I implore you, we have to move forward. We have to be brave, and it really starts with us. Again, 41 million people will die this year, probably many of them needlessly. We can't cure aging yet, but we're getting closer. And without human data, we will never be able to do it. So medical tourism, the boiling point, uh, the thing that I usually get fried for in the media, I'm actually really proud of my involvement. I have always been very, very careful about how I talk about medical tourism. But these medical doctors, these people who come through to try medicine, they are literally my heroes. I took an opportunity to do a study on people who were participating in these therapies. Some of the things that I asked was, do you think that aging is a disease? Uh, most of them thought aging was a disease, which means that they generally follow our area and agree with some of those points. I asked all of them, do you think that aging can be cured in your lifetime? None of them did. I asked them if they thought that being part of creating new medicine for the future was important for them. Every one of them agreed 100%. Do not underestimate the patient. They are not coming for false hope. They are coming to change the world. The stakeholders are everyone, essentially. The patient today is the number one stakeholder. The people who are sick today need access to drugs. When you're running your drugs through clinical trials, I ask you to use them outside of the clinical trial. Use them on people who are too sick for them. Use them on people who are considered too old. Too many people are disqualified from drugs. You know, 80 years old is the cutoff for using drugs in clinical trials in most cases. But we estimate now that an average person might live to be over 100. They should be given access to this medicine. 
medical doctors, they need to be given the right to treat patients anywhere in the world. They, they, they are afraid to use new medicine because they're afraid of the implication. And they're given drugs, they're given tools that don't cure disease, that merely treat the symptoms. The government, governments have trillions of dollars that they can save by using a new pre-regulatory path. Uh, the savings is there. Investors, you could find out how well these companies' drugs work before you get into very expensive clinical trials. Universities are sitting on millions of patents. Literally millions of patents are going unused that need to be used for the benefit of humans. Biotech companies, of course, uh, we can benefit by reiterating drugs quickly, knowing what works and what doesn't work. Pharmaceutical companies are starting to get into the game and we're very excited about that. But most importantly, you, because you're the most important person to yourself. And uh, you will be a patient. All of you will. Hopefully for preventative medicine before something catastrophic happens. But eventually you will all be patients. Best choice medicine is a, is a, a, a looped system. We identify drugs that might work. We put them into review. Uh, we put them into a database so that people and doctors can get access to them. Patients get access to the drug only after doing a whole bunch of pre work, uh, pre blood work, pre imaging work, uh, all, meeting all the requirements. The drugs are reviewed again. If they're great drugs, then send them out to the regulatory system, but we also hope that great drugs will loop back into the system and stay open for those case uses that I talked about in which people cannot get access to the drugs in a clinical trial. When I started BioViva and I did the first test, a lot of people came out of the woodwork. Uh, people emailed me about their sick children their sick loved ones. <laughs> oh, it was pretty tough because they thought that I was the woman that was going to solve it all. You know, I can't explain to you the pain of working in a system in which all of those people have died. We have to do better. We can do better. Best choice medicine can create affordable therapies, more affordable than the therapies we've seen. Medical tourism has already proven that we can cut down even the cost of gene therapies to a fraction of the cost. A gene therapy that goes through the regulatory system comes at a, at a cost of about two to five million dollars on average. In medical tourism, that literally is a few hundred thousand dollars. And I know that sounds expensive, but it's a lot less. And that's the type of competition that these markets need. They need healthy competition to keep them straight, to make sure that people can afford the cure when it comes out. And by treating aging, we can actually bring the cost down significantly from there because we're treating the biggest medical unmet need. George Church is a scientific advisor of my company, BioViva, and we believe that we can get gene therapy down to the cost of $2,000 per dose. If you would be so kind, you can take a picture of this QR code. You can go and read the BCM paper and you can sign the petition. It costs you nothing and it actually takes a lot of my time because as we get enough signatures in each country, I get to actually talk to your government. I, need, I get to demand uh, that they put in a pre-regulatory route for access. A great reminder of being more human than human. Martin Luther King said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. We must always put our egos aside. This is not about your degree or your car or your house or the money in your pocket. This is about saving lives. That's why we're here. That's why we got into this industry. 
We're gonna have to take chances to make that happen. We cannot fall back on a regulatory system that is risk averse to you know, use that as an excuse why we don't move faster, why we just need to raise a few more million dollars. Let's go, let's help patients now. I'm gonna do a quick update on BioViva. I don't have much time. BioViva is my third child. I absolutely love it. Uh, we have been working on uh, CMV as a gene therapy delivery method. Yeah, I've really changed tone here because it makes me happy. Uh, CMV can uh, fit more genetic material. Um, the human version uh, can actually fit today about 15 KB compared to the 5 KB or 4.8 of AAV. Uh, we want to start delivering multiple genes. We've already started making these uh, gene therapies, and um, we are essentially combining a bunch of the genes that I took initially, and then we're looking at some new ones as well. So uh, think Clotho, Folostatin, telomerase reverse transcriptase, PGC1-alpha, FGF21. We want to see how many of these genes we can get into uh, one vector and see what sort of benefit we can actually have to human cells and hopefully in short-term humans. Uh, the great thing about it is when we buy AAV gene therapies, if I was to take those five gene therapies, I would have to buy five gene therapy doses. Um, each one of those might come at a price of $100,000, $200,000 or more. And uh, the idea is to get all of those into one delivery method so it would only just have one cost instead of, you know, one to two hundred thousand dollars times five. That becomes really cost prohibitive. Uh, in our paper at PNAS that came out, I think, last year, uh, we showed that we were able to redose the gene therapy and deliver it intranasally, unlike we do, um, we have protocols in AAV that are uh, done with needles. Uh, this one was just done inhaled, snorting your gene therapy. How fun is that? <laughs> we still work with integrative health systems. It gets us in a lot of trouble. BioViva is not able to treat patients. Integrative health systems doesn't treat patients. They work with a network of 12 doctors who can treat patients. And now they work with the Institute of Regenerative Medicine and Advanced Therapies. And, um, and that's a great um, move forward for uh, that consortium. Uh, and then, really quick, if I can show you, this is just a sneak peek. We're going to have a paper come out uh, in the next year of what happens with pa patients when they take telomerase reverse transcriptase. And this is just a sneak peek at the shortest 20th percentile of their telomeres. So um, we have been told many times that the, the telomeres that really matter in these patients, especially for immune senescence and other short-term uh, needs that are necessities to the human body, are the shortest telomeres. And so here's what happened in 10 patients. And you'll see even more data when the, the, when the paper comes out. So we had an average gain of 1.22 KB. Some of these patients are years out from treatment. Uh, even actually almost five years out from treatment. Everyone is healthy, and, um, and so the, the news is good. We have not seen in cancer actually in these patients at all, and I know that that was one question people had. I have one minute. I have a new company called Genorisis. I am not the CEO of this company, thank goodness. Um, it is run by a medical doctor named Dr. Nico. Um, we have a scientific ad advisor who's going to run our first animal study at the University of Arizona. The company just opened to its seed funding and closed half of it within a matter of a week. Uh, we are going after glaucoma. I think that when we think about healthy longevity, we often think about muscles and appearance, but senses are really important and eyes are really important. And with this one, we are going to regenerate the optic nerve. We believe that the gene that we'll be using here also has applications in the central nervous system uh, for spinal inju 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 injury and a few other things. But glaucoma is a great place to start and people are excited because we finally have a goal that's super obtainable. Our scientific advisor in this case actually has gotten drugs to IND within two years and hopes to do that here. It's an 80 million uh, 
patient population. And um, it doesn't focus on just lowering the IOP, which is the interocular pressure. It actually is regenerating the nerves. We're going to use a gene. We're going to inject it uh, into the eye, which is a standard practice that our ophthalmologist does uh, often. And uh, we hope that you're interested in learning more about this company. If you want to learn anything about all three um, of these fabulous companies, you can take a picture of any one of them and learn some more and reach out to us. And thank you so much. Oh, one question, sure. We just take one question again. Our we can skip the questions. People are getting into the... Perfect. Oh, we have one in the back. Yeah. Yeah, hello, Liz. Uh, thank you. Very uh, interesting. I had no time yet uh, to, to read uh, the white paper, but I have, uh, uh, I would say, uh, one uh, remark, general remark, maybe also for other speeches. Don't forget that... Uh, since 2019, life expectancy is not rising anymore. Uh, yeah, and this is a big problem. And okay. Second thing is uh, in your uh, white paper, is it explicitly mentioned that the people who follow a treatment uh, should engage to, and the organizations to organize that should engage to publish the results? And that's it for me. Yeah, so when, when you're working with something like best choice medicine or a pre-regulatory route, I think that I'm answering one of your questions here. There are two ways that you can go about it. One, you can create a law so that companies can work within uh, the constraints of a legal system, which is, which is wonderful. Uh, this is a law in which it offers some flexibility. Um, or you can work by the Helsinki protocol, and that's why when we work with medical tourism, we actually release the data of what's happening with patients. So that is, um, I, I think I'm answering your question there. And as far as lifespan, yes, you know, we, we saw uh, multiple hits in lifespan with the opioid crisis and with uh, COVID and um, emerging uh, difficulties and issues with our healthcare systems. I think we're all really aware of those. But I'm hoping that we start on an upward trend again and get back to the promise of the, the at least 110 years. But I would like to see us go far beyond that. And with genetic engineering, of course, I would like to see us become more human than human, uh, let down our egos and get on with the future. So thanks for the question. Thanks.